any company that wants to survive in the future needs to have innovation capabilities. The capabilities to renew itself, either by developing new products and services, by designing new processes, or by reinventing the way it creates value. Innovation is implemented through projects. Through projects, we shape our future. However, innovation is also very, very uncertain and unpredictable, and therefore highly risky. We venture new technologies, we address previously unaddressed needs, and the more innovative a project becomes, the higher is the likelihood of failure. We should actually expect that most innovation projects fail. We should become comfortable with the fact, we should incorporate that in our thinking, we should have a portfolio perspective on innovation. And that's why I, as, a, as an innovation researcher, became very much interested in portfolio management. This is a process in companies with which they try to set ideas and make them to products and later create value for customers. With portfolio management, we try to facilitate that creative ideas are generated, that initiatives are aligned with uh, that we can successfully coordinate all the resulting projects that try to bring this uh, to the people, these ideas. Portfolio management basically pursues three objectives. First of all, we know not every innovation project will be successful, so we should not try to increase the success of every innovation project. We should have a portfolio perspective and increase the overall value of the portfolio. Even one big breakthrough can make up for all the failures and attempts that didn't work. Second, we do not want to put all our eggs in one basket, just like you would invest all your money in just one stock or company, unless it's your own. So we want to have a balanced portfolio. We want to have some projects that are really risky, but have great potential. And we want to have some projects that are bread and butter, relatively safe, but bring us some value. And the third objective is, and this is maybe the most important one, we want to make sure that all innovation activity that we do is aligned with our strategy, that all innovation projects that we do bring our organization one step closer to where we want it to be. Sounds relatively easy. Just select the best projects and go execute. But it's not that easy. And companies struggle with that. They struggle with portfolio management because on the one hand, all the projects are really innovative and complex and unpredictable. Things happen and uh, you cannot predict them. But also, and this is the second reason, they are highly interdependent with each other. Some projects rely on results from other projects. Some projects are worked on by the same people. It can't be in two places at the same time. And some projects share similar risks the same technology. So you can't make single decisions on each of these projects. You always have to think holistically, make an overall portfolio decision. And that's hard. That, that really becomes complex. I didn't think that when I started researching that, but it's really difficult. And the most problem we have is that this decision-making process is highly political. There are very people involved in a company because there are high stakes here. We're talking about the future of the company. And there's many different people, different areas and expertise backgrounds involved in making these decisions. And everybody has their own perspective and they don't agree with each other. Everybody thinks their ideas are the best and their projects should be done. So there's a lot of conflict, a lot of negotiation and haggling. It's not necessarily about finding the objectively best solution. It's about compromise and negotiation. And that makes it also very complex from a social perspective. So how can companies do it? How can we successfully manage our innovation portfolio? We've been researching the practices of portfolio management for 15 years now. And uh, we analyzed companies, over 1,200 companies, regularly benchmark them to identify what is it that they do and what of these practices lead to success. So we wanted to find out what top performing companies did differently 
than the rest. It's not about identifying one single best practice company and everybody says, oh, we want to be like them. It's about finding consistent practices that work for a larger population of companies, of top performing companies, and try to distill from that how can we learn from that and how can we make our own companies better. One early insight, and by that time that surprised me, but now looking back it's, it's pretty obvious, one early insight was that it didn't matter at all what frameworks they used, what methods and tools they used, whether it was IT supported or not. It wasn't that important. What import was, was important was the interaction between the people. Not only the decision makers, but all the affected people, the stakeholders of the portfolio. In companies where they communicated openly, where they collaborated and supported each other and uh, laid the conflicts in the open and constructively discussed them, they had better decision quality. And they were more successful in the end. And the companies were then also more successful. But there are some practices that top performers consistently do better than low performers. For example, they have a clearly defined strategy and communicate them to their employees. That's not self-evident. Can you make the right decisions? They also have not only clarity, but also some operational clarity because they have clearly defined processes with clear criteria that are accepted and understood by everyone. And even top management supports and doesn't come along and say, we need to do this project because last week I was in Silicon Valley and I saw this thing and we need to do that. Even top management adheres to these rules of these processes. And of course, as a necessary condition, needs some proficiency in doing project management. And individual projects, managing a whole collection of projects is also difficult. So that worked for a lot of companies. But is that still enough today? The business environment is increasingly changing at an exponential speed. Competition is lower. We have technological disruptions, for example, through artificial intelligence. We have global diseases of fast product development when you talk about the vaccine development. So the business environment becomes increasingly turbulent. And do these practices making decisions for our innovation portfolio work? In our recent studies, we have identified principles that seem to be connected with the business environment was, and some were even better connected with success in a highly volatile um, environment. But still implement their long-term strategy. We called them triple A portfolio management because they happen to start with an A. It's uh, ambidexterity, agility, strategic Ambidexterity. Ambidextrous people are people that can use both their hands equally. Right-handed, many are left-handed, but only very few are ambidextrous. For companies, this means they can do processes and contradict each other equally well. They can do exploration and exploitation. Exploration means you venture into the unknown. You develop new competences that you did not have before, completely new technologies, for example. Exploitation means you hone your existing competences and become better and better at what you do. Existing uh, companies that have been successful in the past are typically very good at exploitation. And they need to be. This pays the bills. Doing projects that exploit your competences, uh, your core competences, built on your strength. But only very few companies are good at exploration. But you need to do both equally well. If you don't exploit today, you're dead. If you don't explore, you're dead tomorrow. So you need to do both. And in portfolio management, the decision for one type of project is always a little bit more biased to the exploitation side because they fit to the company. They build on our strength. They uh, reflect our strategy well. So many companies do too many exploitation projects. Some top performers can do it. They are ambidextrous. They do both equally well. They have a sufficient share of very innovative projects in their portfolio. How do they do it? Okay, they maybe have a slight advantage there because they have a really strong innovation culture. They support their employees in trying out new things and they allow failures, not all types of failures, but failing innovation projects. 
And they have a strategic mindset that is more entrepreneurial. They like to venture into risky territory and they are proactive. And they have the willingness to cannibalize their own investments. Cannibalization is really hurtful. It means when you have a new innovation project that is so fundamentally new that it makes everything that you did before or many of the things that you did before obsolete. Think about all the expertise that the German automotive industry had in combustion engines and now comes along electric motors that work differently and you don't need much of the competence anymore. That really hurts, cannibalizing yourself. But it's better to do it to yourself than let others do it to you. But there are also easier ways to achieve ambidexterity. Very easy decision processes, for example. Instead of comparing the projects with each other and deciding which to do, you decide before, okay, I spent so much money on exploitation projects and so much money on exploration projects, and that's final. 10% for exploration, for example, and 90% for exploitation, arbitrary numbers. And then they don't compete against each other, and you don't have to compare them with each other, but only within these so-called strategic buckets, as we call them. The second A that I would like to talk to you about is agility. Agility means that companies are better able to quickly respond to changes and realign their innovation portfolio when it's necessary. Top performers use principles from agile development more often in their projects. We know this from, from software for many, many years. Um, agile product development, but it's been increasingly used also in physical product development. So this means we have a fully dedicated team that is basically self-managed, that tries to uh, iteratively de deliver value, strongly customer focused, and is um, uh, time boxed, so, so to say, that they deliver something in, in fast intervals. And top performers do that more often than, than low performers. But they also install agile processes at the portfolio level, where they decide on the projects. They don't decide which projects we do, then execute. They continuously decide and think about the, uh, the portfolio, iterative decision making. And they support their employees in, um, uh, in having more autonomy and, res and individual responsibility. For example, they empower them through a leadership that puts the interests of the leader more in the background and supports uh, those that she or he leads. Some call this servant leadership. And these practices help to make companies more agile in their portfolio management. The third principle, the third A, is strategic adaptiveness. This means to recognize that Rome wasn't built in a day. And larger innovations are also not done by one project. They are done by a sequence of projects that build on each other. Not necessarily all successful. On the contrary, from failures you learn a lot. So successive development of projects that build on each other. And top performers know this and consciously manage these project sequences and create options and exploit them. This way they're not only able to just implement their strategy and just select projects that fit to their strategy, but they shape strategy along an innovation path or a journey. How can you improve on that? You can systematically learn from past projects to try to bring the knowledge that was developed in one, knowledge, uh, in one uh, project to the next. You can support that, for example, through table, stable teams that have some continuity, uh, that the same people work on consecutive projects. And you look into the future and build roadmaps of future projects. One decision-making style that is very supportive of this, we call real option reasoning. You might know options from, from the finance sector. Uh, an option is uh, the right, but not the obligation to decide at a later point in the future whether you want to buy or sell a stock, for example. A real option is something similar. You create options with projects, but you only invest a very small amount in many different options, and then as time unfolds, you learn more, uncertainty is reduced, and then you see, okay, some of these options didn't work. So I have to rigorously kill them and shift resources to other options that are more promising. This might hurt a bit because you don't want to be involved in projects that get killed, but you have to install this mindset in the company because not every innovation project is going to be successful anyway. 
And this real option reasoning is very suitable for an uncertain environment. Actually, an option becomes more valuable the more the environment is uncertain. But this has to be supported by an innovation culture and an entrepreneurial orientation in the company so that you can do these decision-making processes. We found that companies that adopt these AAA principles of ambidexterity, agility, and strategic adaptiveness were more successful. Actually, it predicted over half of the variance in, in success of these uh, companies. Especially the combination of these principles is valuable. And that um, means, for example, that it's good to have ambidexterity and create a lot of exploratory projects, but you also have to have the agility to seize these projects and, and follow up on them uh, when the window of opportunity is right. So they, they combine each other, these principles. Classic portfolio management assumed the world was stable. In today's business environment, we need AAA portfolio management. We need to be ambidextrous, agile, and adaptive. And thus, we can hopefully create more sustainable and viable organizations for the future. Thank you. <laughs>